In closing, let me say that the current presidential election cycle is not merely an exciting game over which the likes of Wolf Blitzer, Chris Matthews, and Katie Couric can banter, enthuse, and wax eloquent. We are electing this year from two decidedly mediocre candidates, a president who will fight, face unprecedented domestic threats from a religious, religiously motivated enemy very unlike any we have previously fought. I believe that foreign policy is the ghost at this presidential campaign's banquet that all know is present, but everyone pretends not to see. The questions above and myriad other specific foreign policy questions ought to be repeatedly asked of the candidates until they give direct answers. My proposed answers clearly are not definitive. But any candidate that answers the questions above in an evasive or dim dismissive manner would show Americans his intention to continue the full war intervention that is now bleeding America in terms of lives, money, and political cohesion at home. And such a continuation will ultimately lead to a disaster for the future of Americans and their ability to, to, and, and their ability to live as they choose and not in conditions imposed on them by their governing elite's willful self-deception and national security threats that have long gone unaddressed and that will now no longer wait. Thank you very much. Happy to take questions or duck tomatoes or <laughs> whatever. Uh, Sir. Mike, we got two stores in Grand Rapids. <laughs> Sorry, I, I ran immediately. There's a men's store in our hotel. They had every kind of men's clothing except you didn't sell shoes. <laughs> and I only had 40 minutes. <laughs> Perhaps not now come. <laughs> have you made a calculation of the cost of the interventions which we have made? I brought up on the idea that we can't have guns and butter, and we've got now guns and butter and $140 barrel of oil. Yes, sir. Have you made that calculation? I, I think that you can't have, at, at least at the level we're spending now, sir, you can't have guns and butter. Our military, uh, God bless them, is now stretched to the point where it's about to crack. If we weren't, and I have to say from my own perspective, if we weren't shamefully fielding mercenaries to fight for the United States, the American military would have cracked already. Uh, we have to make a decision. This can't go on forever. I think, the, I think Secretary Gates uh, has been extraordinarily frank publicly about this. It can't go on as it is. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm not at all one who looks to blame America first. But I have to say that if you look at the Congress, 35 years after the first embargo, they've managed to move daylight savings time up three weeks. There's a certain amount of, of fault there. Um, I don't know how to get around it, but I think we have to come to a crunch point very soon, sir. Certainly within my lifetime. And I don't know how to, how to even wake people up to do it. I don't know what kind of a shock it will take. Ma'am. What role do you perceive the military industrial complex and their lobbyists to be playing in this mess? Uh, I was fortunate enough to sit at Repeat a table with Repeat the question. Uh, Repeat the question. The question was about what, what role does the military industrial complex play in this uh, mess that we're in. I was fortunate enough to sit with Colonel Hohenstein and, and Mr. Cook before coming over, and we were talking exactly about uh, General Eisenhower's warning. And I think if you just simply look out at what you can read on the Google every morning, we have very few soldiers and we have a lot of weapons we can't use. Um, they keep buying aircraft we can't use. They keep buying uh, 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 aircraft carriers and nuclear submarines. I, I think we're in the thrall of these people. Um, I don't know how to break that one either, ma'am, but I think it's very clear we're in a manpower-intensive war. We're buying, for example, the F-22 Raptor 
uh, which has no ability or very little ability to support our ground troops. So there seems to be a, I, I tried to write in the book that in many ways we have not escaped the Cold War yet. We still uh, think as if the Cold War was going on. We buy weapons that are appropriate to use against the Soviet Union. We um, look for proxies to do our dirty work. Instead of going after Osama bin Laden, we want a, a, a tin pot Pakistani general to do that for us. So I think it's a, there, there's much, um, there's much buying and spending with military industrial people that I don't understand why it's done. It could be that I'm just not smart enough. The power enough. of those lobbyists. It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary to, to be able to, to, to go ahead with this. Um, I, the Raptor is the one that interests me. It, 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 it couldn't provide ground support until they found a way to strap one or two bombs on it. And it's still not a very good at it. But uh, the thing that, I, I don't know if it happens here, but at home in Washington, we have an all news station. And there are hours in the morning, six to seven, seven to eight, and eight to nine, that are sponsored by uh, uh, Grumman and McDonnell Douglas and all the guys that build guns to kind of inculcate, I think, in the listeners that the fact that this is good business to, to keep paying for these things. Uh, I'm one that believes we should have a military that ought to be able to obliterate enemy, any enemy that needs to be obliterated by us. I think we need to be more discerning in picking enemies. But nonetheless, we're not there now, and it's because we're still behaving as if the Cold War was on, I think. Sir? Uh, some maintain um, that what FDR would have called premeditated invasion and subsequent occupation of Iraq was strategically uh, really about Iran. Uh, would you comment? And incidentally, what has happened to those neocons, including the much discredited Paul Wolfowitz? They're all around Mr. McCain at the moment. They went from, from uh, El Duce Giuliani to uh, Mr. McCain. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a big conspiracy guy. I think the, the, the government of the United States is very comfortable in fighting nation states. I think they don't understand yet very well the threat from non-nation states. And so when they went to Iraq, um, it, it made sense in Cold War terms. But I do think this administration in particular has a desire to smack the Iranian, Iranians for reasons that are beyond me. I think Iran, if any country more than Iraq, is containable. They're surrounded by Sunnis who'd rather kill them than us. They're surrounded now by American military bases. Uh, and in addition, they're running out of natural resources. In 20 years, they will, will have very little left to export of natural gas or oil. Uh, but as time goes by, it looks like Iraq was a step toward Iran. Um, I don't know how it's going to work out. I keep hoping that we're myopic. You know, we hit Afghanistan, we hit Iraq, we'll hit Iran. Sooner or later, we'll get to the real enemy and hit Saudi Arabia. But uh, that, that's pretty far in the future, I'm afraid. In the back, yes, sir. Uh, 